Good afternoon, everybody. Please accept my apologies for the late start today. Um, let me do one thing at the top, and then we'll get to your questions. We can get going here. Um, the President received an update today from uh, his Homeland Security Advisor, Lisa Monaco, about the forecast for Hurricane Joaquin. Uh, he received additional details about the preparations that are underway at FEMA uh, in advance of the storm. Uh, a couple of those points. FEMA has increased its staffing at our 24-hour National Watch Center in Washington, D.C. to provide additional reporting and monitoring of the situation. FEMA incident management assistance teams and other lead elements have either deployed or are preparing to deploy to potentially affected areas to support response activities and ensure there are no unmet needs. Uh, FEMA staff uh, have been activated to prepare for the establishment of potential incident support bases, which preposition supplies uh, like water, meals, blankets, and other resources closer to potentially affected areas. Uh, and of course, FEMA maintains a significant stockpile of commodities, including millions of liters of water, uh, meals, blankets, uh, and other resources like that uh, at distribution centers across the country. Uh, the final thing uh, I'll say here is that, uh, particularly at this point, uh, we encourage uh, all Americans that live in areas that could potentially be affected by Hurricane Joaquin to monitor local radio, television, uh, and official social media accounts for updated emergency information, uh, and as always, uh, to follow the instructions of state, local, and tribal officials. Um, so this is obviously something that the President and his team are uh, uh, closely monitoring here, and I anticipate we'll uh, be doing that through the weekend. So uh, with that, Kevin, we can go to your questions. Thank you, Josh. Uh, the President and you have had high praise for the Secret Service in recent days uh, for the work they did last week. Uh, but what is the White House reaction uh, to the reports that agents widely accessed a committee chairman's personnel file and that aspects of that file eventually became public? Uh, are apologies enough uh, in this case? Well, uh, Kevin, as you point out, the, uh, uh, the Director of the Secret Service and the Secretary of Homeland Security uh, both called uh, Congressman Chaffetz personally to offer uh, their uh, offer an apology on behalf of the agency. Uh, both uh, men, both uh, Director Clancy and Secretary Johnson, uh, indicated a commitment to holding accountable those who uh, may have uh, improperly handled uh, information. Obviously, a, an agency like the Secret Service takes very seriously the responsibility that they have to properly handle sensitive information. Uh, and uh, the report that was released uh, does raise significant concerns about whether or not all those procedures were, f were followed, uh, or at least whether those procedures were followed properly. Uh, so, um, you know, I do think we, uh, the President certainly has confidence that, uh, uh, that the appropriate steps uh, will be taken to hold uh, accountable those who uh, didn't follow those procedures. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't restate uh, something that I mentioned yesterday, uh, which is that uh, we did see a significant mobilization uh, under the command of the Secret Service uh, over the last week to um, professionally uh, and effectively provide security for the visiting dignitaries uh, to the United States. That included President Xi, who made a high-profile visit to the United States, including a visit here to the White House obviously Pope Francis, as well as uh, more than 100 uh, dignitaries uh, in New York for the United Nations General Assembly. The Secret Service wasn't just responsible for providing for the security of each of those individuals, uh, particularly when it comes to the Pope. Uh, there were hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Americans over the course of uh, his visit who made an effort to try to see him. Uh, and the Secret Service was responsible not just for his security, but also for the security of those Americans who participated in those events. Uh, and so I think the, the results of that visit uh, and, um, and the security that was provided uh, is a testament to the tremendous uh, professionalism and competence uh, of the men and women of the Secret Service. And you know, when there are mistakes that are made, uh, the, we've seen the director uh, do the right thing, which is step up and take responsibility for them, offer an apology where it's appropriate, but also uh, assure not just Congressman Chaffetz, uh, but also the President and the American people, uh, that uh, there will be accountability. Uh, and I think we can have confidence that that will happen. Has the President lost uh, confidence in leadership over there to address this appropriately? Uh, not at all. And in fact, I think their uh, initial response to uh, this uh, report, I think, is a, a strong indication that there is effective leadership in place of the Secret Service. Uh, to say nothing of 
the effective completion of the very difficult but core mission uh, that Secret Service uh, carried out uh, over the last week or so in the midst of a series of high-profile visits. Uh, one more. Uh, Russia's foreign minister says his country and the U.S. coalition see eye-to-eye -eye on targets uh, of their fight against terrorism in Syria. Uh, is that accurate, and does that reflect the activity over the past uh, 48 hours as the U.S. sees it? Well, as the Secretary of Defense uh, acknowledged yesterday in his news conference, uh, you know, the early indications from the Russian military operations is that despite their claims that they're focused on ISIL, they're actually carrying out military operations where there are few, if any, ISIL forces operating. Uh, so it certainly calls into question um, uh, that declaration. Uh, and it raises the concerns that you've heard us state previously uh, about how if Russia is genuinely focused uh, on fighting ISIL, then they will make the kind of constructive contribution to the 65-member uh, anti-ISIL coalition that the United States is leading. We have put forward a strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL, uh, and we are working with 65 other countries uh, to implement that strategy, uh, and we would welcome the, uh, the constructive contribution uh, of Russia to that effort. Okay. All right. Jeff. Josh, following up on that, does President Obama feel that President Putin broke his word after their meeting this week with regard to their intentions in Syria? Well, the conversation that the two presidents had focused on um, a range of things about the shared interests that we have uh, in stopping the spread of, uh, of ISIL extremists uh, and, the, um, uh, and certainly to counter uh, the safe haven that they're trying to establish for themselves uh, inside of Syria. Uh, there was also a, a shared view when it came to the need for a political transition inside of Syria. We have long made the case that the root of Russia, uh, of Syria's problems uh, are, uh, uh, is the political turmoil inside of Syria. Uh, and the only way to address, you know, whether it's the spread of ISIL or the significant humanitarian crisis uh, that started in Syria, is to address the fundamental political problem there. Uh, and you know, the case that we have made uh, and the case that generally Russia has acknowledged is the need for a political transition. Now, there are important differences of opinion about what that political transition ultimately looks like, uh, but there was agreement about the need for some kind of political transition inside of Syria. Strikes, though. Uh, and so when it comes to the uh, airstrikes, you know, we've indicated that we would welcome a constructive contribution from Russia to the um, anti-ISIL uh, coalition. Uh, and uh, we haven't seen them uh, be prepared to do that yet. Do you also <coughs> agree that there would be talks to deconflict um, the uh, operations? These Russian airstrikes today happened before those talks. Mm -hmm. Is that does that indicate that these that the talks are even worth having? Uh, they are worth having, Jeff, and they continue to be both a priority for President Obama and for President Putin. And in fact, uh, I can tell you that there was a, a call that was hosted today uh, by U.S. Uh, uh, defense officials uh, and some of their Russian counterparts. Uh, this is a telephone call that lasted uh, about an hour uh, today. Via, it took place via uh, video teleconference. Uh, it was led by Alyssa Slotkin over at the Pentagon. She is the Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. Uh, the discussion focused on uh, ways the United States and Russia can uh, communicate uh, and effectively deconflict uh, our operations uh, inside of Syria. Uh, there were, th and in some cases, these were actually uh, uh, some basic aspects of our operations uh, that um, we want to try to agree to to avoid uh, unintended consequences here. Uh, these are, so there was a discussion about uh, ensuring that aircraft, military aircraft inside of Syria, uh, are operating consistent with international rules and safety regulations. Uh, there was a discussion about uh, ensuring that military personnel operating inside of Syria are, are communicating on internationally recognized channels. Uh, and all of this is an effort to uh, deconflict uh, our ongoing operations there. Uh, this was the first discussion of what I anticipate will be um, uh, a series of additional discussions uh, about, um, ab about deconflicting our efforts. And uh, in the context of that call, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out, uh, that once again, uh, the Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense, um, Alyssa Slotkin, underscored the importance of 
focusing our efforts on our shared objective, which is uh, degrading and ultimately destroying ISIL. Uh, and, um, and she pointed out that the Russian military operations that we've seen so far uh, raise some concerns because Russia is targeting areas where there are few, if any, ISIL forces operating. Is there anything that the United States is doing or can do to protect the Syrian opposition from these Russian airstrikes? Well, uh, Jeff, I think the challenge here is one, well, let me say it this way. I think the burden here uh, is on Russia. Uh, and the fact is, carrying out indiscriminate military operations against the Syrian opposition is dangerous for Russia. And the reason I say that is that it is only going to prolong the sectarian conflict inside of Syria, if not make that conflict indefinite. Uh, and it also risks Russia being drawn even more deeply into that conflict. Um, and we've already seen, and I say this knowing that Russia has already acknowledged that there's no military solution inside of Syria, that ultimately a political transition will be required. Uh, and Russia, as I mentioned yesterday, will no, be no more successful in imposing a military solution on Syria than the United States was in imposing a military solution on Iraq, uh, or than the Soviet Union was in imposing a military solution uh, on Afghanistan. The way that Russia has carried out these indiscriminate strikes against the Syrian opposition uh, has also uh, further isolated Russia. Uh, we've seen uh, statements of concern from members of the U.S.-led anti-ISIL coalition, statements from Turkey and Jordan, other leaders in the region, but also around the world, uh, raising concerns about Russia's activities. Uh, and I think most tellingly, uh, we saw statements from both Iran and Saudi Arabia on this matter. And those who understand the nature of this sectarian conflict will not be surprised to hear that Iran's response to Russia's military activities uh, was, uh, was one that was filled with words of praise, uh, while the statement from Saudi Arabia was filled with words of criticism. Uh, and I think that, is, that uh, I think highlights uh, the risk that uh, Russia is running here. Uh, and I guess the two last things I'll point out here is that, that the effect of these kinds of indiscriminate airstrikes uh, essentially drives what would otherwise be uh, moderate elements of the Sunni opposition to Assad uh, into the arms of extremists, creating an extremist problem, uh, or I guess I should say exacerbating an extremist problem for Russia inside of Syria, but also exacerbating the extremist problem that Russia has inside of Russia. Uh, so that's why you heard me say when there were initial reports about Russia moving military uh, equipment to Syria, that, that it would be counterproductive for Russia to double down on the support of President Assad. This is exactly what I was talking about. Uh, and this is going to have consequences for the efforts of everybody, including Russia, to counter extremism uh, in the region and around the world. You know, and the fact is, these grave consequences for Russia uh, are more dangerous than any diplomatic response that could be imposed on Russia by the international community. Is the president happy with what Russia is doing? Uh, obviously, we would prefer uh, Russia to make a constructive contribution to our ongoing anti-ISIL effort. Uh, and it certainly is not in the interest of the United States for Russia to exacerbate this sectarian conflict. But ultimately, it's the Russians that will pay the highest price for that. Gardner. Um, Josh, the Russians seem to be particularly targeting groups funded and armed by the CIA. How will the president respond? And is this a renewal of the Cold War-like war of proxies? It's not at all. Uh, and here's what's uh, important to understand. I was making reference to indiscriminate. Uh, it's not uh, Airstrikes. Well, I, uh, I think it is indiscriminate because, and let me explain why. Because Russia, in justifying these actions, suggests that they are uh, carrying out operations against um, opponents to the Assad regime. Right. The fact is, there are extremist, ideologically driven uh, 
essentially terrorists who are opponents of the Assad regime. These are groups like ISIL and Nusra that uh, have been the focus of, uh, of our operations. There are also elements of the Syrian opposition that are, could more accurately be described as moderate elements of the Syrian opposition that are simply arming themselves to try to defend their communities, their homes, uh, and, uh, and themselves. Uh, the Assad regime has been carrying out terrible acts of violence uh, against these, uh, uh, these, um, uh, these civilians. Uh, and that, so that's the kind of indiscriminate uh, activity that we've seen Russia engaged in. And the danger associated with that kind of indiscriminate um, military action uh, is that it distracts from the organizations that should be the focal point of these kinds of activities, namely ISIL, uh, and serves to drive away the kind of moderate opposition that ultimately the international community, including Russia, is going to be counting on to be a part of the political transition that's long overdue inside of Syria. But Josh, I mean, the reason I'm pushing back on indiscriminate is your own military analysts are saying that these attacks are actually very well thought out. They're going after the people that now are the greatest threat to the Assad uh, regime and also are closest to Russian military facilities. Uh, those people also happen to be the people who are being funded by the CIA on our, sort of on our side. So that it's not, they're not doing this willy-nilly. They are going after the people who represent the worst threat to the Assad regime and their own position in Syria. Well, uh, let me just uh, issue a clear disclaimer uh, once again, which is that I'm not going to uh, engage in a uh, specific discussion of any activities that the, Syria, that the CIA may be involved in or may not be involved in inside of Syria. What I will say as a general matter, though, is that there, and this is something I've said before, which is that there are opposition groups uh, inside of Syria that have benefited from uh, U.S. support. Uh, and there's a variety of ways in which that support has been provided. It includes uh, the training and equipping operation that we've talked about in here that hasn't yielded the kind of results that we'd like to see. Uh, but it also includes uh, support in the form of things like um, uh, uh, medical equipment uh, and other um, uh, 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 rations and other supplies that are useful to uh, fighting forces in a difficult uh, environment. So there are also moderates here in opposition groups with whom we have no relationship. Uh, the fact is these kinds of uh, groups that are operating against the Assad regime are, are pretty fluid. Uh, and the fact that these kinds of alliances are so fluid actually underscores the risk that Russia is taking. That by taking strikes against these moderate Syrian opposition groups, they only make it more likely that these, what, what, are, what could currently be described as moderate Syrian opposition groups, seek to align themselves with the extremist ideologues that Russia claims to be fighting. Uh, you know, so that's the, that's the concern that we have, uh, and that is the risk that Russia is running when they um, wade knee-deep into this sectarian conflict. What, what's your view? I mean, you're talking about all these risks that Putin seems to be taking on. He's not an idiot. What, what, what is the White House view of what Putin is trying to achieve here? Well, uh, I certainly wouldn't use that word to describe uh, President Putin. That's correct. Uh, but, you know, I, I think for weeks now, we have indicated a lack of clarity about what Russia's true intentions are inside of Syria. Uh, and that is to say, that is not to leave anybody with the impression that the United States was somehow surprised that Russia was actually using that military equipment that they uh, moved into Syria in the last few weeks, but rather to describe um, the choice that President Putin faces about how to uh, protect Russia's diminishing influence inside of Syria. Uh, the fact is, Syria has been the client state of Russia in the Middle East for years. And Russia has made a significant investment in that client state. Uh, and over the last five years, Russia has seen that client state uh, essentially unravel. Uh, and it has risked the significant investment that they have in that country. And uh, this significant military deployment is aimed at shoring it up. Uh, and the question that uh, President Putin faces is how exactly to shore that up. Uh, and continuing down a path of carrying out 
military operations in an indiscriminate fashion against the Syrian opposition is actually going to run counter to the stated goals of, of Russia because it only will prolong uh, the sectarian conflict that has torn that country apart. I, I want to put this gently, but there seems to be this view that Putin keeps stealing your lunch money. You know, there's a the kind of, that he seems to be... I've heard that before. Yes, exactly. Yeah. What, what is there, are, you just have to sort of wait out that view? I mean, there's this sense of this sort of playground battle that he seems to be getting the best of the president on. Yeah. How, how do you fight that, or can you not, or do you just leave that aside? Well, uh, let me take that on in a couple of different ways. I think the first is that the... If you examine the interests of our countries in the region, that is not at all what's happening. Uh, the fact is, Russia is responding to a situation inside the Middle East from a position of weakness. Their influence in that region of the world is waning. Uh, and I've seen some of the media reports have pointed out that the military base that Russia operates inside of Syria is actually the last military base that Russia operates outside of the former Soviet Union. Uh, and that base uh, is located in a country that over the last five years has been torn apart uh, and where the security situation there is highly unstable at best. And Russia is responding uh, to that urgent situation, trying to shore up their investment. So this has not been a long-term uh, uh, benefit from Russia. This is, uh, this is Russia trying to salvage uh, what's left of a deteriorating situation inside of Syria. Uh, now, the second thing is a consider careful consideration of U.S. interests. The President has been very clear from the beginning that the prolonged commitment of U.S. military personnel on the ground inside of Syria is not something the President was willing to consider. And instead, we have uh, implemented a, a strategy that has put uh, the safety and security of the American people at the top of the list. And you know, I walked through yesterday some of the uh, military actions that the United States has taken inside of Syria to take extremists off the battlefield there. Uh, and this includes uh, operations against uh, uh, individuals like Abu Sayyaf, uh, who was killed in a US military raid inside of Syria uh, over the summer. Uh, an ISIL operative named Janaid Hussein, uh, who was actually a British national, uh, who was recruiting um, uh, Western targets for lone wolf attacks. Um, uh, and this includes also an ISIL leader and foreign fighter recruiter named Tariq Al-Harzi. Uh, to say nothing of the strike that was taken against David Drujan, who is a French national, uh, but an extremist uh, operating inside of Syria, not affiliated with ISIL, but yet very focused on uh, planning significant attacks against Western targets, including the United States. Uh, so the President has worked aggressively to safeguard our interests in that way uh, without making the kind of commitment that draws the United States into another land war in the Middle East. That is something that the President does not believe serves our interests well. Uh, and again, I made reference to the fact that that's uh, exactly what Russia is getting drawn into uh, and will have to pay uh, the significant price for it. Mara. You said earlier that you're, you're, you and Russia have a shared objective, which is to degrade and destroy ISIL. <coughs> Are you con confident that that is actually Russia's objective? Uh, I do believe that Russia is being forthright when they say that they are quite concerned about the threat that is posed by ISIL. Uh, and are prepared to take military action to try to destroy ISIL. But that's not exactly what they're doing right now. Well, I think that's how we started this briefing, yeah. which is so, that they are taking strikes in the country where uh, there are few, if any, ISIL operatives uh, in place. But that doesn't make you question that that is actually their objective, to destroy ISIL. I guess I'm... Uh, I think what I was walking through in response to Jeff's question are some of our shared priorities. That is clearly a priority of the United States. It's a stated priority of the Russians, and uh, I wouldn't have any reason to uh, dispute that that is one of their priorities. Uh, I certainly have ample reason to dispute that they're taking the actions that are uh, going to accomplish that goal. In fact, I think they're actually taking actions that are counterproductive uh, to that goal. Right. Justin. Uh, 
First, I was just wondering if you could give us a TikTok of what the president's been up to for the last couple days on this, whether he's had conversations with Secretary Kerry, the CIA director, meetings in the Situation Room, just how he's been briefed and updated. Well, uh, I don't have a lot of detail to share with you. The president has been briefed uh, by his national security team about events on the ground inside of Syria. Uh, and the president has had conversations with members of his national security team uh, about it, but I don't have any specific meetings to, to tell you about. Uh, but um, look, Russia has been a, a fluid, uh, Syria has been a fluid situation for quite some time. Uh, so it's not unusual for the president to get updates uh, on conditions on the ground when things are changing rapidly. And that certainly has been the case over the last uh, 24 to 36 hours. Um, I'm wondering if President Putin's latest actions have led the president to reconsider uh, either what the U.S. is going to put into Syria or what the U.S. might do in other regions where uh, we're in some sort of conflict with, with Russia, including Ukraine. Obviously, uh, arming Ukraine has been kind of a issue that's dangling out there. And so I'm just wondering if, if any of those things is under new reconsideration after what's been going on? Uh, no, and I, I, I made this point yesterday. I, I would not, uh, at this point, I don't, I don't, we haven't seen the kind of uh, uh, change that would prompt a significant, um, uh, you know, broad reevaluation uh, of our policy either with regard to Syria or with Ukraine. Let me just stipulate that I frequently uh, convey to all of you that the President and his team are always reviewing uh, our strategy in Syria and looking for areas where we might be enjoying uh, a little bit more success uh, and um, sort of refining and um, uh, reforming our strategy as necessary. That's part of an ongoing policy process. Uh, but this has not caused uh, you know, a broad scale or a broad reevaluation uh, of our strategy inside of Syria. When it comes to Ukraine, uh, you know, the situation there I think is pretty cut and dried, which is we continue to see Russia interfering in eastern Ukraine. We continue to see them destabilizing and violating the territorial integrity of a sovereign nation. Uh, and as a result, uh, Russia has sustained serious and worsening economic consequences. Uh, you know, and so we've talked before about uh, the, uh, the decline in the value of their currency, uh, the, um, the downgraded economic growth projections for Russia. The expectation is that they'll, their Russia, that their economy will shrink by three to four percent this year and will remain in uh, recession next year. Uh, they're now the fi world's fifteenth largest economy, one step behind Spain, uh, and declining. So, you know, I, the the situation in Ukraine, uh, unfortunately, hasn't changed. The kind of change we'd like to see uh, is for Russia to begin implementing. Uh, their side of the bargain when it comes to the Minsk agreements. And once they start doing that, that is how uh, Russia can um, start to uh, reintegrate uh, into the international community. Uh, our friends at Reuters have reported that uh, there's hundreds of Ar Iranian troops that are now entering into Syria <coughs> to bolster the Assad regime. I'm wondering both if you can confirm that, uh, say, if it's going to lead to any steps from the U.S., and also if you've heard from our regional allies, I know that you mentioned statements from uh, the, the Saudis earlier, but the Saudis, the Turks, if the Iranian intervention there is going to lead them to either bring more troops, more military equipment, whatever, into, into the situation. Well, Justin, I think you've actually highlighted what may be the most important piece of evidence to indicate how Russia's military activity is worsening the sectarian conflict uh, inside of Syria. Uh, I have seen those reports, we're aware of those reports, and we're taking a look at them. Uh, I cannot independently confirm them. But if true, uh, and the reports are coming from a variety of sources, it would be a, uh, a rather apt and an even powerful illustration of how Russia's military intervention inside of Syria focused on an indiscriminate bombing of, Russian, of Syrian opposition uh, targets has worsened the sectarian conflict there, that you see uh, at least according to these reports, Iranians racing to Syria to take up arms and join in the fight. Uh, that is not good news for the Russians. Uh, and that is consistent with um, a worsening sectarian conflict that only puts off a political solution, uh, a political solution that the Russians themselves have made a priority and said will be necessary uh, to solving the problems inside of Syria. And the last one, um, just to shade off the conversation now with Gardner, I, I know that you can't confirm um, whether 
the CIA has backed any of the rebel groups that were uh, targets of, of the, this bombing, but do you know if any of the targets received U.S. backing of some sort, any sort of assistance? And if so, or even if not, what your message to rebel groups that might want to work with the U.S. would be who are worried about uh, that not providing them any protection against the Russians? Well, for uh, well, I'll just restate again that I will not be in a position to, to discuss uh, 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 any activities that the CIA may or may not be responsible for inside of Syria. Uh, but for a more specific analysis of the targets that were hit by Russia yesterday, uh, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense. I certainly wouldn't rule out the possibility uh, that there may be some opposition groups in that part of Syria uh, that have received support in one form or another uh, from the uh, United States. Uh, and uh, again, it reflects the risk that Russia is taking by carrying out these kinds of indiscriminate operations. By failing to discriminate between uh, ideologically driven extremists like ISIL and Nusra uh, and moderate Syrian opposition elements that have a political concern with President Bashar al-Assad's leadership and have taken up arms solely to defend their families and their communities um, is going to lead to bad outcomes for Russia. It's only going to deepen a seri the sectarian conflict. It's only going to uh, further inflame sectarian tensions inside of Syria that results in more Sunnis directing their ire at Russia, both inside of Syria and back home in Russia. That is the risk that Russia is running right now. Uh, and it has significant consequences for the national security of Russia. Last one. Uh, I know that you, <laughs> you said that you weren't surprised that Russia had used its, its um, uh, the military equipment that it had been bringing in. Were you surprised by the targets that they had, they had chosen in this initial way? There had not been a discussion uh, between, uh, between the presidents uh, in their meeting in New York on Monday uh, that included uh, operational details. Uh, so um, there was not a uh, advance notice that was provided other than, uh, you know, the, um, the notification that was provided uh, to the United States by a Russian military official in Iraq. Okay. John. The President spoke some time ago about what he wants to accomplish before he turns the keys over to the next President. I mean, it, it, it's clear Syria is going to be a mess at the end of, 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 of the second term. What, I mean, what, what realistically at this point does he, does he hope to, to accomplish? Well, uh, at this point, you know, we, it's, uh, it's hard to sort of on a day-to-day -day basis uh, draw conclusions about an environment that's so fluid. But I, I think it's clear that what the President's top priority has been all along uh, is to prevent uh, extremist organizations uh, using the chaos inside of Syria to establish a safe haven that could then be used to attack uh, U.S. interests or even the U.S. homeland. Uh, and that will continue to be the focus of our efforts there. Uh, and so I guess what I would say in terms of over the next year, what kind of progress do we want to make? Uh, making progress in terms of applying pressure and even taking out uh, leading ISIL figures operating inside of Syria and Iraq would be a priority. Uh, further strengthening and, where possible, expanding the international coalition that we have built to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. We added three new members to the ISIL coalition just this week. That's an, an indication of uh, sort of the further expansion uh, of that uh, coalition. We've also seen recent announcements from the British and the French about the possibility that they would uh, take uh, additional action inside of Syria. So that's an indication that our, uh, that the members of that coalition are becoming um, uh, even more active in it. Um, and then the third thing, and this, in some ways this is the most, most difficult one, is there's no military, for all this discussion of uh, our, uh, our military actions there, which are critical to uh, the national security of the American people, for all of that military action, we are going to ultimately need a political transition. There's no military solution that can be imposed on Syria. A political solution will be required. And, uh, you know, hopefully over the next uh, year or so, we can make more progress than we have so far uh, in trying to um, 
at least build a mechanism uh, for uh, talks about a political transition to take place. Didn't Putin have a, a point when he said at the UN that right now the only forces, back to the military component, mm -hmm. the only forces on the ground that are battling extremist groups like ISIS are forces of President Assad and Kurdish militias. Well, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, you can check with the Department of Defense on this, but I'm not sure that President Putin has a very strong case when he talks about Assad's forces fighting ISIL. The fact is Assad's forces have predominantly been engaged in the, kind, in the areas where we saw Russia take strikes yesterday. Uh, and again, those are areas where there are few, if any, uh, ISIL forces. So I'm not sure that his case is very strong there. His case is stronger when he talks about the effectiveness of uh, some Syrian Kurds and Syrian Arabs uh, who have been taking the fight to ISIL on the ground. But those are precisely the opposition groups that the United States and our coalition partners have been actively supporting, both through uh, airstrikes by supporting uh, and supporting their efforts on the ground, but also in providing the kinds of uh, uh, equipment and material uh, that are that are valuable uh, in uh, uh, in a fighting environment like that. But, but then there's just last question. So the, the, the president's resolve, the, the, he, he has said consistently for some time now that Assad must go, uh, uh, remains. There's no, you, you, you're adding the word now and you have for some time ultimately, uh, you know, political, tra ultimately a political transition. Yeah. Is, is, is there any solution that would involve the Russians, as you've said is necessary, that would continue Assad's, uh, uh, you know, role as, as, the, as the president of that country, uh, you know, for some period of time? Well, let me explain the use of the word ultimately. Uh, the reason I keep using that has less to do with Assad and more about uh, explaining why, if a political solution is required, why the United States continues to take robust military action to protect the country. And uh, it, by saying this situation only ends with a political solution, um, I, I don't want anybody to be left with the impression that we're not going to do anything until we start to get a political solution. So that's why I typically use the word ultimately there, that we're going to do these other things to protect our interests and to protect the country while we pursue a political solution. But when it comes to Assad, which is a legitimate question, the things that Assad has done inside of Syria, uh, perpetrating terrible acts of violence against innocent civilians, uh, have caused him to lose the legitimacy to lead that country. Uh, and I'm referring to legitimacy in two different ways. The first is he's lost the moral legitimacy to lead that country. No leader who is willing to use the military of that country to carry out uh, heinous acts of violence against that country's citizens uh, is fit to lead the country. So there is a simple moral case about what uh, Bashar al-Assad has perpetrated on, uh, on other human beings, S Syrian citizens. But there's also a more practical argument to be made about how Assad has lost legitimacy to lead that country, which is that there are, that depending on sort of how you draw the lines, probably 80% of the Syrian pop population no longer views him as a legitimate leader of Syria. They don't, he no longer exercises authority in the areas where they live. They no longer view him as a legitimate leader of Syria. So if we're gonna try to unify that country again, something that Secretary Kerry has said uh, that Foreign Minister Lavrov told him uh, is a priority of the Russians. That as, just as a practical matter, just doing the math, if 80% of the country uh, is not controlled by or is viewed by uh, Assad as a legitimate leader, it's not possible for him to continue to lead that country, which is why we need the kind of uh, political transition uh, that includes a moderate Syrian opposition. This is the, the inherent tension in the case that uh, the Russians continue to make. They say, well, we need a political solution inside of Syria, uh, and that's why we're supporting Assad. It is not possible to have a political transition inside of Syria that results in Assad continuing to lead the country because he's not supported by uh, the vast majority of that country's citizens. Okay. Major. Josh, you used the word indiscriminate many times today. And I want to try to see if you and the administration are arguing that the, it is indiscriminate because it's an accident or it's indiscriminate because it's intentional. Because there's a big difference between the two, and it goes to the likely U.S. response should this behavior continue. Uh, let me try to say it more clearly, which is that we believe it is important, and this is uh, clear in the operations that the United States and our coalition partners have taken out, have, have carried out. 
it's important to discriminate between the targets that you're considering. The, uh, the United States and our coalition partners have discriminated in those targets. We have focused on hitting uh, ISIL targets predominantly. There are other extremist organizations that we've obviously carried, strikes, carried out strikes against. Uh, and we've avoided taking strikes against members of the moderate Syrian opposition. Uh, and it's Russia and the Assad regime, frankly, that have, that have essentially described the Russian or the Syrian opposition as essentially one unit and failing to discriminate uh, between ideologically driven terrorists uh, and Syrian citizens who are just trying to defend their homes and their communities and their families uh, is a grave mistake that will lead Russia even more, uh, even deeper into a sectarian conflict. Thank you for that. It's an intentional mistake on Russia because there are some who look at it and say Russia doesn't really know the terrain that well, they're bombing lots of different things and are not really sure what they're doing. What I'm trying to get at is do you believe, and does the administration believe, Russia in fact knows what it's doing? It's a miscalculation from your point of view, but it is nevertheless intentional. Uh, it is a grave miscalculation, uh, and it is one that carries significant risks for Russia uh, and for the broader region. But uh, at this point, I don't have any reason to call into question their ability to hit the targets that they intend. So it's intentional. So it's intentional. I think they are hitting the targets that they intend to hit. Very much. Uh, but I do believe that that is, and there's the position of the United States, and I think many observers, that that is uh, counterproductive. Okay, so help me understand what you are saying today and what Ash Carter said yesterday. Ash Carter said many things, <coughs> among them, the most colorful metaphor of the day, the price goes to him for pouring gasoline on a fire. Yeah. What I hear you saying is this is a gross miscalculation. We're more or less content with the Russians screwing this up to their own. Uh, in their own way and, and are willing to sort of stand by and watch them inherit all the negative things we think are going to come from this. So which is it? A gross miscalculation they're going to come to rue or point gasoline on a fire? Mm -hmm. Well, Major, I think uh, Secretary Carter, uh, you can ask his spokesman, but based on what I saw of the, well, I read the transcript last night, so uh, we did. So the point that I think that he's trying to make is that uh, is actually the same one that I am that by wading more deeply into this sectarian conflict, by carrying out uh, military operations uh, indiscriminately against the Syrian opposition, they're only fanning the flames of the sectarian conflict. Uh, and uh, the point that I'm making is that, um, that Russia will have to pay the costs for that. Now, let me also be clear that we don't view that in the U.S. interest either okay. because uh, and the reason I make that point is I just sort of described to John that, you know, the one sort of the three things we hope we could make progress on would include uh, a political transition inside of Syria uh, because that ultimately will be necessary to solve all of the problems plaguing Syria, including the ability of extremist organizations to uh, create a safe haven inside of Syria or to address this terrible humanitarian crisis that we've seen in terms of the refugee problem. So. The problem, though, is that by exacerbating the sectarian conflict, the Russians are essentially prolonging the sectarian conflict and making a political resolution much more difficult to achieve. Uh, and the consequences will principally be borne by the Russians, who will be uh, inspiring the anger uh, and violence of many Sunnis inside of Syria, including potentially some Sunnis that could previously descri be described as moderate. Uh, so uh, there's no, there's no uh, satisfaction I take uh, in conveying to you uh, that Russia is making a grave error and miscalculation here, but it is a fact. Uh, and um, it, it frankly is why Secretary Kerry continues to uh, engage in conversations with his counterpart, Foreign Minister Lavrov. It's why we're going to continue to engage in conversations through this uh, uh, operational military channel to ensure that our operations are properly deconflicted. Uh, and it's why the United States is going to continue to lead an international coalition to pursue our strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Last question. So since you consider this an intentional act from Russia, do you believe 
that the targeting of the forces we are supplying and backing by whatever means is an act of aggression against the United States and its interests in Syria, and therefore ought to be subject to a formal diplomatic and strategic protest. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I, I can't say with a lot of specificity uh, precisely which targets Russia hit. So I can't confirm. But you know they've been hit. You know that we're supportive of them, and you believe it to be generally intentional. I'm asking you, is that an act of aggression against the United States and its interests worthy of a protest to the Soviet, to the Russian government? Forgive me. Right. Well, what I've made clear, and I, Mark and I had this conversation yesterday, that the uh, that certainly uh, Russian military activities uh, uh, against uh, opposition groups that are genuinely fighting ISIL do come into conflict with our counter-ISIL strategy. Uh, and we have made that point clear to the Russians. Um, so I don't know if it has taken the form of a, you know, a formal diplomatic rebuke of some kind, uh, but there's no mistaking uh, our perspective on this, and it's been conveyed to the Russians in a, in a, in a variety of channels. Okay, Kevin. Josh, thanks. I want to get uh, a big picture view of the administration's policy in this region in particular. Can you give me a grade at this stage, given all that's happening? Uh, it has been fluid, and I know that you said that there's always a, a constant and ongoing evaluation, but if you were grading right now, what grade would you give the administration? Well, I would, I would hesitate to do the letter grade thing because it is uh, the situation on the ground is fluid. But I think that we have um, pretty, been pretty forthright uh, about our concern about the situation inside of Syria, uh, and it's multifaceted. Uh, certainly one principal area of concern is the unthinkably terrible humanitarian situation uh, inside of Syria uh, and uh, in the region uh, that has been caused by uh, Rus uh, Syrians fleeing violence uh, inside their country. And it's heartbreaking. Uh, to read some of the accounts of these otherwise um, um, innocent Syrian families who have been terrorized in their own homes, uh, subjected to violence either by extremists like ISIL uh, or uh, the Assad regime, uh, and been forced to, to leave their homes and in some cases even leave their country. Uh, and uh, that is something that um, I think as the President has described, uh, is something that stirs our conscience. Uh, what's also true is that there are uh, extremists uh, that are operating inside of Syria. Uh, and we see ISIL extremists trying to establish a safe haven inside of Syria that they could use to uh, not just destabilize Iraq, uh, but also to uh, inspire um, uh, you know, acts of violence in other places as well. Um, so that's you know, certainly a, a subject of some concern uh, two. So, barring uh, a grade, would you say you're dissatisfied with the way things are going, broadly speaking? Well, I don't think that there's anybody who says that they're satisfied about the situation in Syria right now. What is true is that the United States has been effective in building and leading an international coalition uh, of 65 countries to implement an integrated strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. And there have been important military actions that have been taken uh, against uh, uh, leading ISIL targets. Uh, those are strikes that have um, made the United States safer. We have made some progress in shutting off different uh, lines of financing that ISIL has used to fund their reign of terror. Uh, we have also uh, been ramping up uh, and made some progress, modest progress, uh, in countering uh, ISIL's uh, efforts to use social media to radicalize individuals uh, around the world. Uh, so uh, that's not to say that there haven't, and you know, and, and also what's also true in Syria is that by um, uh, backing some moderate Syrian uh, opposition elements, uh, they have been successful in driving ISIL out of about 17,000 square kilometers of territory inside of Syria. Uh, that is principally in northern and northeastern Syria, where that progress has been made. Uh, but it has limited uh, ISIL's access to the border with Turkey. Uh, and you know, there is an active effort underway um, that includes our allies in Turkey to uh, seal off entirely that 600-mile-long border 
Um, so there are areas where we can point to some important progress, uh, but I don't think there's anybody that would say they're satisfied with how things are going in Syria right now. I'll switch gears for a second and ask you about uh, Bibi Netanyahu's comments today at the UN. Uh, he made a very powerful statement about the fact that he felt that not enough people in that body uh, were coming to the defense of the people of Israel. Uh, and he criticized them for standing by uh, deafening silence. Is he right about that? Well, I didn't have an opportunity to see his speech. Um, frankly, I was spending a lot of time preparing for the other questions we've been discussing today. Uh, what I will say is that when it comes to a nation that is ready and willing to come to Israel's defense, no one's been more loyal than the United States of America, uh, including under the leadership of Barack Obama. Uh, and the President is proud of the strong relationship between our two countries uh, and the unshakable bond uh, when it comes to uh, our commitment to Israel's security. Okay. Isha. Thank you, Josh. Um, can you tell me, isn't Russia facing now the same legitimate question you faced when you were putting <laughs> together the coalition to fight ISIL in, in Syria, which is, could you uh, uh, fight the extremists inside Syria without propping up Assad? Because the Russians would say, well, it took, you, it took the United States a long time in the train and equip program to vet who is an extremist and who is a moderate opposition, and still you fail to really distinguish and ascertain with the uh, moderate opposition in Syria that's worth equipment and training. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Isham, I would acknowledge that it has uh, taken some time to build the capacity of opposition forces on the ground inside of Syria uh, who can uh, take the fight to ISIL. They've made some important progress, but there's obviously a whole lot more to be done. The problem is that progress that they have made is progress that they've made not because of the Assad regime, but actually in spite of it. The fact is we've often seen the Assad regime uh, carrying out military operations against uh, moderate elements of the Syrian opposition. Uh, and in, we have not seen the Assad regime demonstrate either the willingness or the capacity uh, to carry out military operations against ISIL. Uh, so. Again, I think that's the other tension in the argument that is being made by uh, the Russians is it's hard to make the case that you're supporting Assad because you want to fight ISIL when Assad uh, doesn't appear to have either the desire or the capacity to fight ISIL. So that's, um, it exposes a significant flaw in the uh, logic of Russia's strategy here. Okay. Cheryl. Um, thanks, Josh. Different subject. Okay. Um, last night, uh, you put out a statement. You're very excited that the government did not shut down. and Very excited <laughs> might be generous. <laughs> Please, whatever. Relief, uh, maybe? Um, and you called on Congress to um, pass a budget that would reverse uh, sequestration. That's right. There are several other big uh, fiscal issues, including highway funding that expires mm -hmm. at the end of this month. Um, and uh, debt ceiling increase as well, uh, along with tax extenders, p potential tax cuts. Do you see that all as one package, or do you think Congress should deal with these individually? Well, Cheryl, you've identified some of the uh, some priorities that we have identified. Uh, some of them, uh, I think all of them are important. Some are even more important than others. Um, I'm referring mostly to the debt limit. Um, but there are other economic priorities that um, uh, that you didn't mention that are also uh, important to us. This would include reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank uh, and long delayed action on cybersecurity legislation. Uh, this is legislation that's been sitting in the Senate for, um, for I don't know how long now, um, but too long. And yet, we actually see the Republican leadership holding votes on appropriations bills that they know won't pass. These are appropriations bills that don't have any sort of bipartisan support, while they neglect the kind of cybersecurity legislation that is critical to our economy, that is critical to our national security, and has bipartisan support in the United States Senate. So uh, I think it makes it difficult to explain exactly what, uh, uh, what Senator McConnell has in mind when it comes to uh, following up on the, the promise that was included in his uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal the day after the election. Now we can get Congress moving again. If he were actually interested in doing that, he wouldn't be bringing to the floor pieces of legislation that he knows stand no chance of passing um, and ignoring 
legislation that's critical to our economy and critical to our national security that probably would pass uh, if they did the work that was necessary to get it done. Now, Senator McConnell has talked about a two-year budget plan, though, now going mm -hmm. forward. I mean, do you have suggestions on the shape of that, what that should include? Well, obviously, we have uh, an informed view on all of these things. Uh, and, you know, our priority has been on preventing a government shutdown, uh, essentially reversing the sequester to ensure that uh, our national security and economic priorities are adequately funded. Um, those have been, that, that's been where our priorities uh, have been. Uh, our view is that we can only accomplish those goals if Democrats and Republicans, if Republicans are actually willing to work with Democrats to get that done. Uh, and um, the last time that Democrats and Republicans were able to work together uh, on budget legislation, they actually did come to a two-year budget agreement. Uh, whether that's appropriate this time or not is, uh, uh, remains to be seen. We'll see how uh, things play out. Uh, but that certainly was something that Democrats and Republicans were able to accomplish together last time they were confronted with this challenge. Okay. Chris. For a second, I just was thinking back to some of the other problems that Secret <coughs> Service has had, and the understandable, maybe outrageous to overstating it, but certainly a, a great deal of unhappiness given that um, the safety and security of the President and his family at times seem to be at risk. And I realize that uh, the comparing what happened to uh, Congressman Chaffetz isn't the same, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of concern on your part. Is there concern on the part of the White House or the President that, that this was that this happened to somebody who was so um, vigorously investigating what was going on in the Secret Service? Well, Chris, uh, it certainly is not routine for the Director of the Secret Service to personally uh, call someone to offer an apology for the conduct of uh, his agency. It certainly is extraordinary for the Secretary of Homeland Security to place the same telephone call. I think that should be a pretty clear indication to you just how seriously uh, the administration takes this matter and how seriously the Secret Service uh, takes their responsibility to live up to the high standards that they've set for themselves that, at that agency. That includes the uh, effective and proper handling of sensitive information. Um, so uh, this is something that, uh, that the administration, but more importantly that the agency, uh, takes quite seriously. And uh, Director Clancy gave his word to Congressman Chaffetz that uh, those who are responsible for the mishandling of this information would be um, appropriately held accountable. Uh, and I have confidence that Director Clancy will do that. Is it something the President takes quite seriously? Is he Absolutely. upset about this? Absolutely. Let me ask you about um, uh, a couple more uh, questions, if I can, on, on Russia, particularly the uh, teleconference that took place today. Mm -hmm. um, is this strictly limited to the deconfliction area, or will some of the conversations continue about targets, some of the kinds of conversations that were had uh, between Secretary Kerry and um, Mr. Lavrov? Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me answer that in a couple of different ways. The first is, this is the first uh, in what I anticipate will be a series of uh, operational tactical conversations to effectively deconflict Russian and U.S. military operations in Syria. Uh, this is something that uh, President Putin and President Obama discussed starting in their meeting on Monday. Uh, and on Thursday morning here in Washington, uh, those uh, conversations began. Um, now, uh, based on the readout of the call that I got, uh, it is not clear to me that there was a discussion uh, of some of the things that you described, including targets. Uh, the discussion focused, uh, at least when it came to the U.S. agenda, uh, on ensuring that aircraft are operating consistent with uh, international rules and safety regulations, uh, and ensuring that communications were being conducted on internationally recognized channels. Uh, so when you have uh, military pilots uh, that are flying aircraft at a high rate of speed, you want to make sure that, um, that these kinds of standards are observed by everyone who's operating there, and that there is an ability uh, to communicate if necessary. So those are the kinds of basics that were covered in the context of this call from the U.S. side. Uh, I'll let the Russians uh, read out what they raised. Um, but this is just the first in a series of calls, and I wouldn't at this point uh, rule out that there might be uh, a discussion of targets and some other things. What I will say, however, and this is something that was reiterated 
uh, on the call by the United States directly to the Russians is that this call uh, and these consultations do not at all represent a change in our policy uh, of limiting military-to-military -military cooperation with the Russians as a result of their actions inside of Ukraine. That policy has not changed, and these conversations will not uh, rise to that kind of broader strategic level. Uh, these kinds of consultations are important, but they will continue to focus on uh, basic operational tactical uh, efforts to deconflict our operations. There have been multiple conversations over the last several days between uh, Secretary Kerry and Sergey Lavrov, and uh, at one point yesterday, before I think that final meeting that went about an hour, uh, that was off the schedule, he came out and said to the media, "Don't listen to the Pentagon." How do you read that statement? Uh, I didn't see that. Um, this is from Sir, this is from uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what he was referring to. Even <laughs> Sorry. Um, and, I, and this just happened, and so you, it may not even be on your radar, uh, okay. that apparently there's been a, a shooting uh, at a community college in Oregon um, in which there may be uh, some fatalities. And again, we don't know any of the details, so I'm not going to, uh, I don't want to project. But I just wonder, as the President looks ahead, and I know that um, whether it's written or whether it's in his head, there's sort of this list of his priorities. Um, when you look at things like uh, limiting access to guns and mental illness, the kinds of things that he spoke about so movingly in places like uh, Newtown, is there a sense that a realistic analysis says that's not something that can be high on the priority list because it's not likely to get done? Or where does that sort of fall mm -hmm. as he looks ahead to how he spends these next 15 months or so? Well, Chris, uh, the issue of sensible steps that can be taken to protect our communities from gun violence continues to be a top priority of this administration. Uh, there are some common sense steps, things like closing the gun show loophole uh, and others, that have strong bipartisan support across the country. Uh, according to some polling data, there is, there's even a majority of Republicans that support closing the gun show loophole. We have not yet seen that kind of strong bipartisan support across the country translate into legislative support in the United States Congress that's sufficient uh, to pass legislation uh, that would uh, uh, again, uh, implement these kinds of common sense uh, solutions. That said, we've been pretty candid about the fact that there's no piece of legislation that can be uh, passed into law by the Congress that would prevent every single uh, incident of gun violence. Uh, but there are some common sense things that we can do, and I think uh, the vast majority of the American people, uh, the vast majority of the American people, share the president's view uh, in wondering why Congress wouldn't take those kinds of common sense steps. Uh, and it's, uh, the President's been quite candid about how this is, ha, uh, is and has been a source of frustration for him. Uh, it has not at all uh, been lowered on the priority scale, but at the same time the President is quite realistic that we'll need to see a fundamental change in, in terms of the way the American people communicate this priority to Congress uh, before we'll see a different outcome in the legislative process. Okay. Michelle. Um, how, if Russia is hitting these targets, and, and many now are saying that there's evidence that they are hitting U.S.-backed fighters, uh, how much of a setback do you see that to the coalition's work going forward? And if the goal is deconfliction with Russia, and they're hitting people backed by the U.S. and destroying work that has been done, how is that not, uh, not a confliction? Mm -hmm. And how could that not have been discussed in this initial contact today? Well, I, I think I acknowledged yesterday that the, any sort of Russian effort to take strikes against moderate opposition fighters who are fighting ISIL does come into conflict with our counter-ISIL campaign uh, and does run into conflict with our counter-ISIL strategy. Uh, and we've made that quite clear to the Russians. And again, I, I can't speak to uh, what additional conversations might take place in, the, uh, in this series of uh, consultations uh, aimed at deconflicting our military activities inside of Syria. But I cer certainly wouldn't rule out that, um, that there might be a discussion of targets uh, in the future. Uh, but when it came to what the United States raised, um, you know, we were focused on some more fundamental issues. So do you see a warning coming out of this? Um, and if they are hitting those targets, which many believe they are, 
what are the consequences for that? Mm -hmm. are, are you thinking possibly some other form of sanctions? Mm -hmm. I think the consequences are is that Russia is wading more deeply into what is potentially a, an indefinite sectarian conflict. This will serve to isolate Russia internationally, uh, and we've seen uh, significant statements of concern from countries like Turkey and Jordan uh, and others who are a part of our anti-ISIL coalition. Uh, Russia certainly risks um, deep and in inflaming sectarian tensions. Uh, in a way that forestalls any sort of political uh, solution inside of Syria, a political solution that the Russians themselves say will be necessary to accomplishing their goals. <laughs> to say nothing of the fact that uh, Russia risks driving elements of the moderate Syrian opposition into the arms of extremists that are operating inside of Syria and inflaming uh, members of the Sunni opposition such that they're prepared to carry out uh, uh, acts of violence against Russia inside of Syria or against Russia inside of Russia. This is the, this, this is the risk that is freighted uh, with uh, Russia's strategic decisions here. And uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, those consequences that I just outlined uh, are far more grave than any sort of international than, than any sort of diplomatic consequences that could be imposed by the international community. So are you saying there's no way there would be international diplomatic consequences? Uh, I certainly wouldn't rule it out, but it certainly will not be as significant as the prospect of Russia being sucked into a years-long sectarian conflict that only makes them more vulnerable to uh, extremist violence. And again, just to clarify, there's no delight taken here in the United States in Russia's miscalculations. The fact is Russia's efforts forestall a political solution that we believe is necessary to stabilizing the situation inside of Syria, to prevent the worsening of the humanitarian disaster caused by the refugee crisis, uh, and to prevent the efforts of extremist groups like ISIL from establishing a safe haven inside the chaos of Syria. Uh, does the U.S. not believe that Russia working, okay, aside from what happens politically down the road, is it not possible that Russia working with the regime now could defeat ISIS? Well, again, Michelle, I think that's going to be pretty hard for them to do if neither the regime nor the Russians are actually taking strikes against ISIL. Well, for now, but it, so, but again, this but this you, you say that that is one of their priorities. This you, highlights the fundamental contra the contra the fundam this highlights the fundamental contradiction in Russia's strategy. They are supporting a regime that has either unwilling or unable to carry out strikes against ISIL, and they are supporting that regime by taking strikes in areas where ISIL forces. Uh, are not likely operating. Do you still believe that fighting ISIS is one of their priorities? Uh, I do take them at their word that they are concerned about the true impact uh, of extremist groups like ISIL uh, continuing to uh, succeed in recruiting foreign terrorist fighters, uh, in radicalizing individuals uh, through social media, and in de destabilizing the broader Middle East. I think they are genuinely concerned about that. As, as, um, as President Putin would tell you, uh, just looking at a globe, uh, Russia is a whole lot closer to uh, the Middle East than the United States is. Uh, oh, go ahead. So the, 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 they are well aware of the risks uh, that Russia faces from extremism continuing to propagate throughout the Middle East. Uh, so I do take them at their word that, um, that degrading and ultimately destroying ISIL is a goal of theirs. But there is a fundamental contradiction in their strategy for which they cannot account. So you see it, do you see it as an impossibility that they could degrade ISIS to the point of not being able to function and then you know, whatever happens politically happens after that? I think it is extremely unlikely that Russia will be able to defeat ISIL if they continue to support a regime that doesn't take strikes against ISIL and further inflames the sectarian divide inside of Syria, and if they continue to pursue a military strategy that's predicated on taking strikes not against ISIL, but against, el against elements of the Syrian opposition, including some elements of the Syrian opposition that are actually fighting ISIL. So that is the, uh, or at least opposed to them. Uh, and again, that is the fundamental contradiction uh, in the Russian position that I think makes clear that they're operating from a position of weakness, and that they're pursuing the kind of strategy that is clearly not in the interest of the, Syri of the Russian people, 
uh, and will ultimately be counterproductive to Russia's efforts to make progress in the direction of their stated goals. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Juliet. Hi, two domestic questions for okay. you. First, in terms of EPA's new ozone standard to deal with smog, this has been decried on both sides today, both the environmentalists and public health advocates. I saw the headline on your story before I came out here. There you go. Uh, could you talk about what balance you were trying to strike and why you decided to revise it but didn't go nearly as far as, as many of your traditional allies had been calling for? Uh, Juliet, for the actual decision behind uh, the formulation of this rule, I'd refer you to the EPA. They can give you a much more detailed uh, and technical explanation for how they arrived at their decision. Um, let me just say as a general matter, particularly when it comes to uh, our critics who suggest that these kinds of rules uh, will be bad for the economy, uh, let me just point out that for the EPA for more than four decades has been working with state and local agencies to cut air pollution. And in that same period of time, they have succeeded in cutting air pollution by 70 percent while our economy has tripled. Uh, so I think it certainly calls into question uh, the claims, the dire claims of some of our critics uh, that this kind of uh, rulemaking is inconsistent with an economic strategy. In fact, the President would make a pretty strong case to you uh, that there uh, is a sound economic incentive for the United States uh, and industries in the United States to be more focused on investments in uh, renewable and clean energy. And then on John Daner and the possibility of him being a working partner in the last few weeks he has here on Capitol Hill, can you give us a sense of to what extent you've seen indications that there may be a possibility to work with him more closely on key priorities before he leaves office? Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, Juliet, there's an open line of communication between the White House uh, and Capitol Hill. and. You know, Speaker Boehner rather colorfully described his desire to clean out the barn before he leaves. Uh, I think that was uh, viewed by many here in the White House, including myself, that that was a rather apt description of, uh, of what needs to happen in Congress in the next few weeks. Uh, and if there is an opportunity for the, United, uh, uh, for the Obama administration to support those efforts, uh, then we'll certainly be a, a willing partner. It will, however, require bipartisan cooperation, that in order for any of this business to get taken care of, uh, Republicans will not succeed in passing that legislation along party lines. Uh, they can't, it's, there simply is not support that they're able to muster in Congress sufficient to overcome the filibuster, to say nothing of the President's uh, veto pen. So if Republicans, including Speaker Boehner in his last few weeks in office, uh, does want to work in bipartisan fashion to um, clean out the barn. Uh, then uh, he'll find partners here at the uh, White House ready to roll up our sleeves and pick up some mops and get to work. <laughs> All right. Uh, John, I'll give you the last one. Okay. I just wanted to ask you um, about what we're seeing over the past two days in Syria. Do the actions by Russia over the past two days make it difficult, more difficult, to recruit fighters uh, to the opposition to the Assad government? Well, John, I think the way that I would answer your question is actually to remind you of how fluid the situation is on the ground. Uh, and I do think there is a significant risk that individuals who last week would be described by an informed but impartial analyst as uh, uh, a moderate opposition figure and a potential uh, moderate opposition fighter uh, and a potential moderate uh, opposition uh, uh, political activist, somebody who could be uh, participate in the uh, political transition that's needed inside of Syria, that as a result of Russia's actions inside of Syria, that that individual is essentially seeks uh, the comfort and protection of extremists, uh, and that they make common cause with extremists to fight Russia and to fight the Assad regime. That seems like an entirely likely outcome to me. Uh, and it highlights why we take no special delight uh, in Russia's miscalculation. But it also highlights, I think more, even more importantly, the grave consequences for Russia's inherently flawed strategy. And as far as the deconfliction talks, which took place today, 
Uh, what's next? Uh, are there more talks? Uh, were all the issues resolved today during that one-hour teleconference? Uh, no. Uh, there will be additional uh, consultations as they uh, work to deconflict their uh, efforts. So I would anticipate additional um, additional communications between um, uh, Assistant Secretary Slotkin and uh, some other members of the U.S. uniformed military uh, in uh, uh, and their Russian counterparts. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody.